Hey everybody, I'm Brian from Hasboy. And I'm Aaron from VTech Academy, and I know a lot about Hondas. So strap yourself in, we're about to fill your brain hole with Honda knowledge. So yeah, this is a special episode, right? This is a special episode. All right, this is a very special episode of VTech Academy. We're gonna go through everything you need to know to do a case swap on your EK. Matter of fact, we're gonna fill your ear holes full of all the information you need to do that. We're gonna stuff your brain with K-Swap knowledge. We're gonna do that. Yes. All right, so guys, basically we were lucky enough to go to Mighty Car Mods and help them out with an EK swap. It was a blast meeting those guys. Absolutely fantastic. Oh, it was amazing, amazing. Yeah, but they asked if we could kind of go over a technical review of what they did and let you know what kind of parts were used uh, in order to get the swap in there and uh, kind of explain how it all works. Exactly. So. We're just gonna go break it on down, part by part, what they used, what you could use, what your options are. Exactly, yeah. So to start off with, they had a 96 2000 style car, which uh, commonly referred to as an EK, although more on that some other day. Or a sixth gen. No, sixth gen, there uh, you go. Technically his was an EK, EK4. It was, it was an EK4. So nice little hatchback, really, really good looking car. And they wanted to do a K-swap in it. So obviously when you start off with a K-swap, first thing you need is an engine. So they happened to use a K24 A3, yes. which they got out of a Cord Euro. Yeah, out of an Australian market, a Cord Euro. Yeah, uh, that that's actually like ten and a half to one, uh, one compression ratio, 190 horsepower, very very similar to what we get in our TSX, and a really good engine. Oh yeah, they match that engine up with the Integra Type R transmission. Right, which is six speed with LSD. Ooh, LSD. Nice. I thought they were, that wasn't legal here. Yeah. <laughs> a different type of LSD. They wanted to maximize acceleration, but they wanted to do some track uh, things with it. So that makes uh, a really good track build. It's an excellent transmission, comes with a factory LSD, and as long as you're not putting a lot of boost or something to it, that LSD works fine. They also had an intermediate shaft from the DC5. They use EGK AX axles. Those are axles from Hasport that work on EG, EK, and DC2. Uh, they're actually custom length. There isn't really a factory link that works well. What winds up happening is a lot of the internet says a certain combination works and actually it's a little bit on the short side. So and we're not gonna say that combination because we don't want you to go get that and try it out. You can drive around the parking lot, but as soon as you go any place. Yeah, you go over a bump around a corner and the axle comes apart. Disaster. So, yeah, so it's much easier just to buy the axles from Hasport or one of the other companies that makes axles specifically for that swap. Again, they use EGKAX. We actually did what's called a road race prep on them, which means we did high temp synthetic grease. Uh, they need to be serviced about once a year if you're actually tracking the car. Uh, but uh, those are available with special requests from Hasport if you're interested. Has anyone worked out yet that Brian's the VTech master? What an absolute boss. Oh, I'm just, I'm blown away with the experience and the knowledge. He's and the, also the, uh, the energy. Yeah, he's the VTech wizard and he's only had 14 Red Bulls so far this morning. He's still upright. One for every flip of his Honda Insight. You can also get axles if you use the Accord intermediate shaft, which is two and a half inches longer. Mm. That creates a much shorter uh, left-hand axle. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, right-hand axle. So, uh, <laughs> right -hand drive, I know, right-hand right -hand drive. drive. Well, it doesn't matter. It's even left-hand yeah, drive yeah. cars. It's just right-hand. Yeah, exactly. But so you're automatically just... swapping it. So anyway, a much shorter right-hand axle, but you need to make sure that you give that information to whoever's building your axles for you that you've got the Accord intermediate shaft. Again, significantly longer. And if you need tips on how to measure bar length, we have a video on that too. Yeah, so. just uh, look up uh, Axle Tech uh, with VTech Academy and there'll be a video right there for you. And because the engine originally came out of an automatic car, they had to get a clutch and a flywheel. They happened to choose an extreme uh, ultra lightweight flywheel, if I recall correctly, and an extreme clutch. By the way, unless you're drag racing, get a sprung hub clutch. Yes, it'll Don't, make your life so much easier. <laughs> so you either take off, particularly if you're gonna street drive the car at all. Otherwise you wind up trying to slip the clutch all the time and they don't want to slip. So, it's kind of like an on off switch. It's exactly right, <laughs> so it's horrible. Hey guys, uh, if you're joining us from Mighty Car Mods, yeah, this is a lot of talking. This is not normally what we do. Uh, we do a lot more hands-on working on cars and stuff like more that. More do, less talk. Yeah, more do, less talk. Uh, this just happened to be that we're trying to review the swap you know, to get it, uh, get that information out to you guys. So yeah, that so you guys can actually, if you want to do it yourself. You can actually do it yourself. Or if you don't want to do it yourself, Ed, but you want to know what you're actually putting in your car. How much it's going to cost. Exactly. Yeah. 
That's why we're doing this. So I've been doing this 25 years. Aaron and I have been doing videos for 10 plus years. <laughs> Over a decade now, yeah. which is crazy. So, yeah, exactly. We also talk a lot about the electronics of stuff and, and you know, what your different choices are and stuff like that. So anyway, uh, they use the EKK2 mount kit. That uh, mount kit looks like this right here. Uh, it does uh, dual height mounting. And the reason it does that is because K20s and K24s, which are the two popular engines, K-series engines to, uh, to swap, uh, come with different height blocks. And in order to get the head in the exact same place each time, so headers fit the same, intake manifolds fit the same, turbo kits fit the same, we designed these mount kits specifically to have dual height. There's about three quarters of an inch difference between the two blocks. So these mounts actually allow you to mount the engine at the higher position when it's a K20, and at the lower position when it's a K24. And that gives you uh, maximum hood clearance and uh, again, keeps the intake manifold and the header in the same place. So it's gonna fit the same whether you're using a K20 or K24. And then it also allows you to, if you know, you're going full custom to set up, you know, if you want more ground clearance, you know, with a K20 or- Well, actually you, you can even clearance. do it with a K24. Yeah, you that's could, what I'm saying. You could set, set up either way. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be, this is the one way for the K24 and this is the one way for the K20. Right, you can actually mount a K24 a little bit taller to get a little bit more ground clearance because the K24 is a tall engine, mm. uh, but you do wind up cutting away some of the hood structure in order to get uh, clearance for that. You can notice uh, our EK back here has the hood cut away because we've got a K24 mounted on the higher position and it's gonna interfere with the hood if, if you don't do that. But a lot of people don't wanna do cutting, so that's why we have the dual height mounts. Exactly. and they. You know, not everybody takes their car to the track where they're going to be going over curbs and stuff and, or they don't even daily drive it. Exactly. Where they have to worry about, you know, hitting your oil pan. Right. So if you want to use any KK2 mount kit on a K24, you also need a block bracket. The block bracket is a little bit different. Uh, what winds up happening is the way the Cordura block bracket works is it's got kind of offset holes on it. So... You can use a CRV block bracket or Hasport makes one, we call it the UKBB or Universal K series block bracket. And that block bracket will not only work on a K20, it works on a K24, which you're gonna need if you have a K24. It actually works on the K24Z, which is a different story altogether. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah, truly universal. It's, yeah, <laughs> true. That's what so, we call it. Then. Yeah, so anyway. Also, the EKK2 mount kit mounts the engine a lot further back than the stock subframe allows. So in order to use this mount kit, you actually have to change the subframe as well. Uh, you have two choices. You can use an EG or 92 to um, 95 Civic manual rack, or you can use a DC2 uh, Integra power steering rack. And both those racks uh, have the way they're constructed allow the differential to kind of move back quite a bit farther than they would with the EK subframe. So that allows you to move the engine back and use this mount kit. And it uh, by moving the engine back, you get better ground clearance because now the oil pan is closer to where the tires are. Uh, but also you have more room in front of the engine for bigger intake manifolds. They use the EKK2 kit in their swap, but you're not necessarily locked into getting that because a lot of it depends on your transmission choices. Right. There's actually four flavors of this mount kit. Mm -hmm. So depending on what you're trying to do, it's going to change the combination. So you could be running the transmission they're running, which is RSX, DC5 Type R, uh, FD2 uh, Type mm -hmm. R, or 06 Civic SI. Uh, that's one set of mounts, this one right here. Uh, you could also be doing the first generation TSX or, or let's see, would it be 03 to 07 Accord, 04 to 08 TSX, plus the Accord R, same year. Basically, you could do any of the K-series manual transmissions. Right. And for, for, you know, to decide which kit you need for that, you can check out our other video that we did. Yeah, including all-wheel drive, by the way. So you want an all-wheel drive car? We got the mount kit for you. They went with the EKK2 kit because they wanted maximum clearance, which means they had to change this up front. Okay. So. But for, for anybody else doing it, doing the K-swap in an EK, they wouldn't necessarily have to. They don't have to, but I would strongly suggest it. But if, if it's difficult to find the DC2 subframe, you can use a kit called the EKK-1, which mounts the engine farther forward and clears the subframe. And that, that's a, another option as well. It's about an inch and a quarter difference, so it's significant. Oh yeah. It's yeah. 
Definitely for cooling and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, having the engine less close to the radiator allows for better airflow and stuff like that. In fact, if you look at uh, Eric Coutil's uh, car, he actually is able to duct it up in front of the mm -hmm. intake manifold uh, because it mounts it. Uh, it basically puts it in the same place as an EG, and uh, and Coutil's car is actually an EG, so he's actually able to duct duct some air out of the uh, radiator up over the top of the motor and, and help with downforce. Um, which can, you could do with a key K. Can you use, is, is there a manual DC2 rack? I, not in the US, not I don't US. think there was. I think that the Integra typically was more of a, uh, a high-end car. So they were almost all, auto, or they, as far as I know, they were all power steering. Because uh, I know that they had, they had a D-series one someplace and I didn't know if maybe that, yeah, but, that came with that. But even in the US, D-series EGs, if they were automatic, had power steering. Okay. Uh, it was only really the, the budget cars that didn't have power steering. Like the car that came with the B16 in Japan had power steering. The, uh, the EX, mm -hmm. which has the D16, it came with power steering. Uh, and of course, all the automatic cars came with power steering as well. Okay. So basically, any, yeah. any, any third generation Integra right. rack will work. A roll rack, rack and subframe will work. Uh, Let's go. Right hand drive versus left hand drive. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so what happens is, you have to get the one right for your car, obviously, but it makes no difference to the mount kit. The mount kit doesn't care whether it's left-hand drive or right-hand drive. It's set up to work with both. That was a design change we made, I don't know, probably 12, 14 years ago. Uh, and uh, so it's gonna work either way for you. And the clearance winds up being the same as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know what I didn't, here's the deal. If you have a right-hand drive, you could actually use an EG power steering rack. You just can't do it on a left-hand drive car. And it has hmm. to do with the way the, the rack is set up. I, did, I just thought of that. Huh. So, so people that, aren't, that are working with right-hand drive cars, EG power steering uh, subframe and uh, rack will also work for you. You don't have to do the DC2 one. I like the DC2 one personally because it's got quicker ratios, but you could use it either way. Whatever's easier to find. And there's plenty of the, of the EG ones around. Oh, tons of EGs. Yeah, absolutely. But on a left-hand drive, you can't do that because it's the way the, the end of the rack is, it actually interferes with the transmission. Uh, it'll actually touch uh, under uh, deceleration. So uh, you can use it, but it's gonna, it's gonna hit. All right, so next, uh, what I'd like to talk about is uh, the engine management. Uh, they did something we've never done before. Uh, we've always used Honda, yeah. but they used Haltech. Yeah, it's it's kind of exotic to us. It is. We've seen it on other channels. They've been doing a big push in in North America. They have been. In fact, a lot of drag racers use it. It uh, it it allows for uh, you know flat shifting and stuff. It get, has more options than let's say a Honda does, which is what we typically use. Uh, in fact, you can do drive by wire very easily with it. Or as they say down there, e throttle. E throttle. Oh, really? Yes. I didn't even hear that. Yes, okay. they kept saying e throttle, e throttle. I'm like thinking, what is e throttle? Uh, aha. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, with, uh, with electronic throttle control, uh, that opens up your uh, options on Ninjas too. You can actually use a K24Z rather easily. That comes with uh, uh, an e throttle. Plus, the fact that it's a Haltech, it doesn't care what the crank angle sensor is doing. The fact that it's pulsing a lot more, as a matter of fact, it likes that. So, mm. the Haltech is actually a pretty good. Uh, choice, and I think we need to do more exploration on using a Haltech uh, mm -hmm. ourselves. Uh, Go into the unknown. Absolutely. Expand our minds. <laughs> now, the Haltech, uh, they use the uh, HT1500, uh, uh, the Elite 1500. Uh, it has a bunch of options, and it's less expensive than a Motec, which is another ECU that mm -hmm. uh, is, is popular with drag racers and stuff like that. Uh, but um, uh, that required actually some special sensors. They had a special wideband sensor they needed with that. Uh, they also had a few other sensors that came along with it. As we explore using a Haltech, I'll have more information on all the things that were required. But basically, you can use all the stock sensors. Mm -hmm. You can just set up the Haltech with an adapter harness uh, in order to plug it in. And then you can uh, uh, probably pretty easily find a base tune from a Haltech that you can get the thing fired up with mm -hmm. and you can get it going. Uh, now. Um, on, on top of that, you need an engine harness. Uh, they happen to go with uh, one made by Speed Science. I've never Speed used science. their stuff. Yeah, I'd never seen the logo before. It kind of looked like a, a rye wire harness because right. they used the same yellow thing and the loom and stuff. Yeah, but, 
So it's it, it's kind of like a, a tuck harness style harness, uh, and uh, that allowed them to you know plug in what they needed, kind of you know tuck away the stuff they didn't need, uh, and that uh, was sized properly for a right-hand drive car. On top of the SS uh, si Speed Science engine harness, they also have an adapter harness. And the adapter harness is set up to interface between the car and the engine harness. Uh, there is a plug called a C101 plug that uh, connects uh, most of the car function uh, to the engine harness. And then there's an E-plug from the ECU that's actually on that as well. Uh, they happen to use one from Hybrid Racing. Mm -hmm. And Hybrid Racing one was long enough that it worked right-hand drive or left-hand drive. Didn't make a difference. That was just basically plug and play as well. Mm -hmm. So that made it really easy to do. So for, for engine harness options, left-hand or right-hand drive, we use a lot of times OEM harnesses, right? We do. And so here's the deal on that. So that's that. another option for, it, for Yeah, people. if you're left-hand drive, you want to use a left-hand drive harness. If you're right-hand drive, you can use a left or right-hand drive because the left-hand one drives longer one. So on a right-hand drive car, it's more than sufficient length. So you could, uh, you don't have to use a, uh, um, you don't have to use a right-hand drive one on a right-hand drive car. You can actually use a right-hand drive on a left-hand drive car, but it's really, really tight. So uh, you might it, end up having to extend a couple. Not so much extend wires, but maybe route it differently. Mm -hmm. So uh, it doesn't want to go all the way over to the far side of the engine bay. It usually comes in through the middle of the firewall mm -hmm. if you do that. So a little bit different. Uh, so that's that's basically the electronics. Uh, they had um, a wide band air fuel ratio sensor, and they had a couple of other sensors that fed information back to the to the computer that were on there. Uh, Again, uh, we'll explore using Hall Tech in the future. Um, one of our vehicles, we want to do a drive-by-wire vehicle, mm -hmm. and, and we'll have more information on that you know, as we do it. That'll so, be cool. We can go e-throttle and, you know. That'll be very cool. Then they'll, they'll quit ripping on us for not doing e-throttle. Yeah. It's funny how people <laughs> say, you got to do drive-by-wire. Drive -by okay, we'll do it. This brings us to fuel and emissions. So on the car that the K-Series engine comes in, the fuel pressure regulator is in the tank. Mm -hmm. And they got what's called a dead-end fuel system. Uh, sometimes on the fuel rail, there's a, a damper that kind of dampens the pump oscillations. Uh, for EK, EG, DC2, any of those, you actually need a fuel pressure regulator in the car. Mm -hmm. uh, they use one from Hybrid Racing. Yes. Hybrid Racing makes a really nice kit. Uh, fuel lines, fuel rail, and fuel pressure regulator. Mm, yeah, their their kit was pretty complete and it was just kind of just deciding where they wanted to route things. Right, and it was actually, theirs was uh, listed as being made for uh, right-hand drive, but I think there wasn't a whole lot of difference between right-hand drive and left-hand drive. I think maybe one of the hoses was longer or something, basically. So, but pretty much it was, it was, uh, it was. Now I'm trying to remember how it, how it went from theirs compared to ours. Yeah, I'm trying to think of where, where their fuel pressure, where their uh, fuel filter was. Well, I guess we need to look at a picture. <laughs> anyway, so Hybrid Racing has one for right-hand drive cars. So uh, they use that and uh, pretty much hooked right up. And uh, we wound up, I think, adding like a 45 degree adapter of some sort and that it work uh, to lay exactly like we wanted it to. But that was pretty straightforward. Um, emissions, so that's part of the emissions thing. So you're going to make a decision on whether or not it's a track car or whether it's a street car and what your emissions are locally. They can actually get the cars through road worthiness or whatever they call it mm -hmm. in Australia with the hull techs. Okay. So uh, that's not something that would work in the U.S. Uh, and in the U.S. it varies greatly. There are some counties and states that don't do any testing whatsoever mm -hmm. uh, for emissions and then there are States that have very strict emissions, like California. Yeah, um, yeah. And Seventeen other states. I think the last check it was seventeen other states that follow California emissions laws. Right, but even those don't necessarily follow them correctly. Like I've had a case swap in my EG, and they still try to make it go through EG or OBD1 emissions. Yes. So they don't even bother. I mean, and they and don't the guys even, they look don't at the motor, and they don't. Yeah, they don't plug it in. They just run it through OBD1 emissions. So uh, I think it's inconsistent at best. For that, uh, we actually. Did all the things we need to do. We have a, a factory ECU with a good tune, uh, with secondary O2 sensor, vent shut valve, fuel tank pressure sensor, all the other OBD2 stuff 
connected to it. Uh, the only thing we really turn off is MICU communication. Uh, but uh, that's something you're going to have to investigate, you know, on, on mm -hmm. your own. Uh, by the way, uh, Magnaflow makes a, a bunch of really nice catalytic converters that uh, are OBD2 legal. Um, you can tell usually because they have like a secondary O2 sensor like sitting in the middle of the cat. Mm -hmm. That's how you can tell it's OBD2 compliant. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of, uh, they, have that, they have that stuff available. So if you want to make it legal, discuss it with whoever you're, uh, enforcing body is and try to figure out what you need mm -hmm. to do. Uh, we are working on that, by the way. We're yes. working on trying to do OBD we're gonna 50 state legal. Yeah, we're working on a 50 state legal case swap kit. Kit, exactly. So again, more on that in the future. All right. Um, it's so be sick. Yeah. I mean, we're sorry, gonna, it's going to be on, mad. It's going to be mad. It's going to be on an EG too. So it should be really cool. I see it over there. I see the car sitting right there. <laughs> Needs some paint too. It's a little bit faded. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. It only needs paint on the top. Yeah. Well, it's true. <laughs> Arizona sign. All right. So now exhaust. So they use the 421 long tube header. Right. We don't remember the brand right now, but I mean, it's kind of a standard case swap yeah. thing. That is for maximum horsepower output. That particular header does very well for high revving cars. It works really good for uh, if you're trying to maximize your horsepower. Um, the uh, exhaust. Uh, they actually had some JDM exhaust that was already on it. I think it was two and a half inch. It was it was really tiny uh, stock exhaust, but it was for a 1.6 liter. 1.6 liter. Originally. Yeah, you want to have a minimum of probably two and a half inch, and probably better, more like three inch, if you're going to do a K swap. Yeah, K series it, love three inch exhaust. Yeah, K series love no back pressure. So that's that's something that's that's important. And there are a lot of mufflers available that you can get to get the right tone that you want. Uh, three inch tends to sound better, I've noticed. Yeah, it's a lot more mellow tone, less raspy. Right. And of course, the, whatever um, muffler you choose also has a big effect on yeah, the sound. Yeah, absolutely. Something cheap uh, is going to sound kind of cheap. Yeah, Tinny. ask around about that. Uh, they just basically made a, a adapter pipe that went from the header to their exhaust that they had on there. Uh, I'll have to see what the... Um, what the final what the final outcome is and i'm sure they're going to build a bigger exhaust for it so mm -hmm. uh because they are doing some other things to the engine as well to try to get more horsepower next is cooling egs and eks come with a half size radiator yeah not really sufficient we tried we've tried using uh, a half size radiator at the track with the yeah with a k not series that much power and oh. a j series and yeah insufficient <laughs> not good so less less than optimal yeah they use a hybrid racing full-size radiator, and that is a really nice unit. It's all aluminum. It's probably, I don't know, two and a half inches wide, uh, really good cooling, and it comes with radiator hoses. So mm -hmm. that makes it nice. And the radiator hoses are set up so that you can kind of trim them in order to fit. Oh, and on top of that, they also bought the, the billet housing. thermostat yeah. housing <laughs> that is adjustable. Yeah, so you can clock it any way that you need. And luckily, the hoses are a perfect fit, and it just has even has the lines on the hoses where to clip it for whatever setup you're running exactly so yeah the hose comes with like dotted lines for 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 adjusting it to the right length and uh, they're and and they're silicone so they're and, yeah silicone hoses really nice quality stuff that also brings up uh the fans uh they used uh the hybrid racing fans which basically uh there's no shroud really but that's <coughs> not hugely necessary uh, because they're big fans they go right up against the face of the radiator. I think they just use a little push through yeah. uh, connectors. Yeah, they use it. a push through connectors that are spring loaded with uh, like foam washers in order to keep them from messing up your radiator when you have them on. Those are also available from Hybrid Racing. Uh, they come with it, so very nice, very nice little uh, setup. Whether or not you need a shroud, probably not. Shrouds are nice. Uh, they help direct air so that it always gets drawn through, but oftentimes on a car that's gonna be used on the track, you actually want it as open as possible so as much air can get through as possible. Um, the bigger problem is what's in front of the radiator than rather what's behind the radiator. Yeah, and they said that they were gonna do air conditioning on it possibly in the future because he's gonna drive it all over Australia. Yeah. And uh, for that, they're probably gonna have to mount the fan on the front where they put the uh, condenser. Very true, very true. Now, uh, heater hoses. Again, track day car, you may or not, may not care about a heater. Uh, it's a nice addition, particularly on cold mornings. 
Uh, heater hoses don't necessarily defog your windscreen though. That's always a problem. Sometimes the hot air blowing on it actually, moist air blowing on it actually makes condensation happen. Makes it worse. Your, yeah, <laughs> it makes it worse. So it's not always necessary on a track day car, but, but if we'll, you're, if we'll if leave you're close, that up to you. If you're close to overheating though, sometimes you can switch over your, your heater onto hot and it'll blow through there. You'll bake, but- Your engine won't. You might be able to get to wherever you need to go to that's a good to point. address that issue. That's a good point. Well, they left the heater on because it gets frosty in the winter time, sometimes on mornings, and it is street driven, so it's not a horrible idea to do. I have a couple of part numbers that I will uh, post with this list on the vtech.academy website. Or vtechacademy.com. Or vtechacademy.com. That, that might be easier yeah. for you guys to remember, vtechacademy.com. Yeah, and basically one of them is like a bulk hose that has five eighths inch on one end and three quarter inch on the other end, which is what you need to uh, hook up to the, uh, um, your heater core and to the, um, back, of the block. Uh, back of the block, actually not the back of the block, but the okay. bypass tube that comes around the, from the back of the thermostat. That is a larger uh, outlet. Depending on your car, most of the time your, uh, uh, your bypass uh, little valve kind of goes off to the right. There's a hose that has like a right angle in it that works really well for that. Uh, I'll put a part number for that as well in there. Uh, if you live overseas, uh, I'm not sure if that's gonna be available. It's gonna be a Gates part number. Uh, one thing you might do is look it up by the part number and see if it gives you application and see where, if you can find that same hose where you live. Uh, we tried using the Gates numbers in Australia and they didn't work. So mm -hmm. he wound up finding some other stuff and it worked just fine. So uh, heater hoses, are a little bit special. Like I said, the one needs to have a three quarter inch size on the other and a five eighths on one side. That one pretty much can be straight. The other one needs to have a nice crook in it in order to, uh, in order to work properly. Left hand drive, right hand drive, it'll be the same. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so uh, next was a shifter. You got a bunch of choices here. Oh my gosh, uh, you yeah. got a world of choices now. It absolutely. Seems like... They wanted to have something to fit under the stock console. So the obvious choice for that would be hybrid racing no-cut shifter. It's basically a shifter that kind of bolts in from the bottom. The shifter mechanism pokes up through the hole that the, that the uh, other style shifter would come drop down through. So it's really a nice unit. I mean, the only way you can tell that that's in there is because they've got their, you know, three-piece dog leg, mm -hmm. you know, shift, uh, shifter sticking up out of it. It winds up working really nice for that. And then, of course, uh, they use the hybrid racing cables along with that. Uh, they've got a new design that's slightly shorter, and it works really well. Yeah, that was the first time I'd ever installed uh, a no-cut shifter. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is pretty clean. Like, it's a little bit tricky with the, the tiny bolts to, to kind of get it to sit in there. Yeah, because that, because there's like a plate that goes on yeah. underneath, a heat shield. Yeah. yeah, and usually when we're doing swaps, we're like, let's just put the shifter on top here and just send yeah. it. Yeah, well, it's funny because I like the shifter up high, like in this car, mm -hmm. where it's just a short travel distance from your hand on the steering wheel to the shifter itself. So I'm kind of a fan of having it up a little bit taller, but a lot of people want to have a stock look and that's the, that's the way to achieve it. So this is cool and all, but what like what about battery, uh, what, charge harness, right. starter cable? So RSXs and Accords and whatever have a charge harness that goes from the battery both to the starter and to the uh, alternator. And uh, basically, you can usually modify that pretty mm. straightforward. So what we did was we basically crimped on some new ends and uh, we used the stock connection to the alternator, stock connection to the starter, brought the cables over. The battery on the right-hand drive car is on the left-hand side of the car. So we brought them back where they would go for a case series normally mm -hmm. uh, and brought them back to the battery. You could mount the battery in the back of the car if you're worried about weight distribution and stuff like that, but then that complicates things significantly and you mm -hmm. wind up running longer cable and stuff like that. And, uh, but, uh, oh, and, and people who drag race cars, if you remount the battery somewhere, you have to put a kill switch in. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, keeping it stock location, again, greatly simplifies a lot of things. So basically we took the stock uh, charge harness which happened to have in a little section for the alternator to connect to the engine harness. That was unneeded because our uh, harness from uh, Speed Science actually had that included in the harness, so it oh, had okay. starter cable and everything. So we, all we really had to do is take out the alternator charge harness, which is a you know fairly like 10 gauge wire, mm -hmm. and the same thing with the, or maybe even eight gauge, and then the same thing with the starter. So we just 
routed the alternator to the fuse box, which again is on the battery side of the car, mm. on a left-hand drive car, and we routed the starter cable to the positive battery cable. So that was all pretty straightforward and easy to do. They actually had lugs there to crimp that stuff, so uh, it made it really easy to do. If you have a left-hand drive car, you do the same thing basically. The difference is you, you bring your cables up through between the intake manifold and the, the idler pulley there and, and bring them over to that side. Uh, or between the intake manifold and this power steering pump. Or, right. or if you're a big baller, you, there's, uh, there's plenty of options for uh, aftermarket ones. Yeah, there is. And you can buy them, you know, from companies make them, you know, to buy them and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, pretty easy. They use a hybrid racing ground. Ground kit. Ground, ground kit. cable kit. You're Something exactly. Like that, yeah. So they found places on both the engine and the transmission that they're able to get ground to the chassis. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they just use the stock ground on the battery to the, to the chassis. But yeah, uh, the grounding cable, uh, kit uh it's interesting uh they i think they have four or five ground cables in there mm -hmm. use them all uh, exactly yeah because you can eliminate a lot of gremlins and chasing stuff down and troubleshooting by having proper grounds exactly right i've seen videos where they take a car and just basically add a couple grounds and pick up horsepower mm -hmm. uh it's it's interesting i think it's uh, to me it's totally fascinating that it works like that it's so funny it's like it's a science, but an inexact science. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Like, I'm sure you can make it exact if you were. Well, it's funny because the, the computers are set up, interestingly enough, that they have a bunch of capacitors and resistors to filter noise out of the different sensors and stuff like that. But if you don't, if your ground cables are too few or not in the right place, you can wind up introducing noise into the system like that and mm -hmm. having glitches with your computer. So it's good to have more than fewer. So yeah, Hondas typically only have two, mm -hmm. uh, but more is better. And there's a lot of options for that too. Yeah, there is. Next we have uh, the intake air tube. Uh, yep. Again, they went with hybrid racing. They have a cold air intake and it's interesting. It's actually a whole silicon tube. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious thermally how that works. Does it, I, aluminum is quite often what's used, I think because it if cool air is running through it, it tends to cool the mm -hmm. tube. The problem is when you're sitting still, things tend to get warm. Yeah, it will heat So sink. yeah, I'm, uh, I'm curious to see thermally if it's better than an aluminum tube or, or mm -hmm. not, you know, just kind of, yeah, I haven't seen anybody do any testing on something like that. I would love to see testing on that, but it's a really nice unit. Oh yeah. And of course there's, there's other options too. You could, a lot of times we just custom make one out of, yeah, out of just, whatever's available. Yeah, out of aluminum tubing, uh, but a three inch diameter tube is pretty much standard for a k-swap vehicle mm -hmm. uh particularly this one you use an aftermarket throttle body that's a little bit bigger so yeah uh, and when it's set up in a cold air setup you get the cool induction noise yeah true right that's, that's right you know, a lot of times people associate exhaust noise with a swap but that that induction noise can be kind of intoxicating absolutely in fact you you're much more likely to hear VTEC on the intake side than the mm -hmm. exhaust side uh unless you've got a really loud exhaust so uh yeah interesting uh, and the other thing is the clutch line. Uh, a couple companies make a braided steel line. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> a braided steel line that basically goes from the clutch master to the clutch slave. Uh, Hybrid Racing even makes uh, clutch master and clutch slave that are brand new you can put in. Uh, but you need the K20 uh, clutch master in it. Uh, I believe they had a K tune one. But then I think they used a stock clutch master. That car, by the way, it had a manual swap. Mm -hmm. in it before they did anything. So I don't know if there's a video on that, but I would go back and, and look at that. I think that would be interesting to see what they did. The braided line is probably a different length for uh, a right-hand drive versus a left-hand drive car. You wanna make sure you get one for your car. Yeah, get the one, one that car. fits your car or, or fits your needs because yeah. they make ones of different lengths where you can tuck it you know, underneath the rail yeah. and, and stuff like that. Right, so. and you can probably have one made relatively easily. Mm -hmm. uh, there are companies that will make you know braided, uh, braided lines for you you know, with the right fittings on, you know. Uh, we have numerous times just popped down to uh, um, a store here locally that does hydraulic fittings and, and said, give me one, you know, 38 inches long, and they were able to do it with these metric ends on it. Uh, so it works pretty easy. Next would be power steering. They wanted power steering. They had the power steering rack, mm -hmm. so they needed power steering. Remember what they did? Same thing Donut did. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Try that again. So that brings us to power steering. 
Uh, they wanted power sharing with the EC2 rack. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? They went with the hybrid kit, just like Donut. But it actually was not perfect for that particular the left -hand drive car. Yeah, right hand drive car. They wanted making or a right few adapters. Car. Yeah. Well, because the rack's on the other side, mm -hmm. the hose normally lays across and comes over. They actually had to put a little uh, uh, 90 degree joint in there in order to get it to work properly. Uh, but those adapters are available anywhere you want to get them, you know, mm -hmm. so they happen to have a freaking <laughs> container full of those adapters and they just pull out the right one and bolt it together. Well, so, it is a super garage. It is a super garage. Good point. The last throttle cable. Mm -hmm. They use the stock throttle cable. They happen to have a skunk intake uh, or uh, throttle body and supposedly it came with the correct bracket. That particular, particular bracket didn't work. It mm -hmm. actually stuck it up too high. So they wanted to make a custom throttle cable bracket. There's probably one out there that can work for that, but uh, we didn't have it. Yeah, we didn't, and plus we couldn't just go to the junkyard and just look and, at a bunch of d different K-series uh, throttle cables. And figure out which one to do. So I, I, it sounds to me like the wrong one, was in, wrong one was in the box for this particular application. I don't know if Skunk has multiple uh, brackets available, but- And I, mean, I think it might be different because it's, again, it's right-hand drive. I, I don't know, and I'll tell you why. Because another guy came there and he had photos of a Skunk throttle body with the correct bracket from Skunk on it. Mm. So. Uh, uh, more investigation needs to be done on that. Forensic files. So let's talk now about optional parts. They okay. actually had quite a few optional parts. Oh yeah, they, they had the whole hybrid catalog thrown at it. They did. A lot of that stuff isn't specifically necessary. Like the shifter, you could use a stock shifter with stock shifter cables. Mm -hmm. uh, the RSX one is a nice nylon unit and you probably pick one up for, I don't know, hundred bucks used. They're getting expensive. They're really expensive new, but not as expensive as the hybrid racing stuff is new. Uh, but they're getting rare. All right, optional parts. They did a fuel pump, and that's because they want more horsepower. Exactly. And that's an easy change. Mm -hmm. uh, and what winds up happening is if you wind up boosting the car, you need that um, bigger fuel pump. Now, uh, the particular one they used is from Honed. Uh, I forget how many liters per gallon it is, but it was a significant upgrade for stock. It's a good idea if your car is old and tired and never had a fuel pump to go ahead and change that out. Uh, a car that runs lean uh, can have problems, uh, but more importantly, you won't get full power. Uh, the ECU will sense that and it'll start exactly. using, yeah, and, and start retarding timing and, and doing other things in order to fix it. So you want to do that. We already mentioned that they had the thermostat housing. Uh, they could use a stock one, even an RDX stock one works, but uh, they opted to use the swivel one available from uh, k -Tune. really nice little unit. They did a Skunk Ultra manifold. What'd you think of that? Yes, that, that manifold's really cool looking because I guess like it's two piece, so you can, I think it comes ported, right? Well, it's, or it, it has air horns in it. Air horns, yeah. yeah. So it's a really nice unit. It's supposed to make good horsepower, naturally aspirated and boosted. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good unit. Uh, they use that particular intake manifold. Uh, it comes two ways, by the way. It comes for, you know, TSX heads and for FD2 heads. So it has the built-in uh, bypass for the- uh, For the water. Yeah, for the water. <laughs> or it comes for like the RSX head, which they happen to have, which means they needed to find a, an extra bypass for that, and they used one that was from JDM Yard. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically it bolts on, gives you the bypass for the thermostat, and is designed basically to use uh, like an RSX manifold onto your uh, K20Z3 head or your or your TSX head or your mm -hmm. uh, Accord your R head. So that's what it's made for. So they had that as well. And then of course they had the Skunk 2 throttle body. Mm -hmm. Giant. Yeah, huge. Yeah. And that makes pretty good horsepower at high RPM. But double check on, on the bracket for the throttle cable because yeah, exactly. the, the one that was, came with ours needed some work. Yeah, so if, in fact, if you look at the video, you can see what the bracket looked like and you wanna make sure that's not the one you're getting. They prettied it up a little bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was, it was a beautiful car anyway. It had been all redone, resprayed, looked super sick. So it you, did. They didn't wanna use that ratty valve cover from the, the Accord Euro, so. They got a new Type R one. They did. They got a JDM uh, Type R red wrinkle coat valve cover. It looked really good, and it actually goes well with the color of the car. Oh yeah. Well, it looks it looks like a Type R. It looks like an EK9. Yeah. yeah and, true. And the red valve cover with the 
the white just pops. Good, good point. All right, another thing they got was uh, drop-in cams from Drag Cartel. Now, these cams are actually designed to use the stock valve springs, yet maximize the amount of horsepower you can get from a set of camshafts. Uh, they're really nice. Drag Cartel, once you run them with a 45 degree VTC, not a full 50 degrees, which may cause problems uh, with like piston to valve clearance, but uh, they sell that as well. So yes, they had the they drag, that also. Yeah, so they had Drag Cartel uh, VTC and Drag Cartel camshafts as well. Also, um, optional, they did the DC5 oil pump. Right, the DC5 oil pump is designed to operate at higher RPMs. Because it doesn't have counterbalance shafts in it, it's much lighter, your engine's not working hard to turn that extra weight, uh, revs faster, cleaner, works at higher RPM. Uh, and those uh, pumps came, again, DC5 Type R. In the US, they came in the uh, RSX Type S. So uh, they're still available, you can still buy them from Honda. They're a really nice upgrade, uh, mm -hmm. and they help you make more horsepower. They'll actually, I've seen people bolt those on and actually pick up horsepower, so that's really a good idea. And that's basically it. That's uh, the whole ball of wax. They've got more modifications coming for that car. Mm -hmm. uh, so stay tuned to their build to see what kind of other things they're gonna do with it. And I think they've got some interesting things to do dyno-wise with it. We actually left and we're recording this video before we're seeing the final results of the yeah. dyno. So we're not really sure how much horsepower it makes, but it should be well over 200 horsepower. Yeah, as long as the, the engine's healthy, that's it's right. gonna make power. And they don't use 10W40 oil in it like they did at Donut. <laughs> the heck were they thinking? As long as they use the lightweight oil that they should be, uh, it should make really good horsepower. Mm. All right. All right, so that was a lot of information. Hopefully it's going to help people out there make informed decisions when they're deciding to do their swap or not to do their swap, but come on, you're going to want to do a K-swap. And I will put up a list of the parts they use and some of the optional choices you have so that you guys can kind of decide for yourself what you want to do. And then also we want to send a shout out to the entire country of Australia. Dude, those people are amazing. Everybody was so nice. Everybody at Mighty Car Mods, including the people that you normally don't even see on camera, were super chill, super helpful, super fun, super funny. Yeah, absolutely. And even the donut guys walked in there in the middle of the whole thing and f***ed up. <laughs> no, they did not. Yeah, not true. <laughs> we're not life. Uh, <laughs> motorsports. We're not going to blame the YouTubers. That's right. Something obviously went wrong out there. Talk us through what happened. I let some YouTuber drive the car before me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, guys, we had a blast in Australia, and uh, we're we'll gonna will a, be back. Yeah, and and we will have a travel vlog because we did more than just the case swap. That's exactly right. We actually went to World uh, World Time Attack, which was amazing, and got us to meet some amazing people there as well. Yeah, I got to hang out with the Spoon guys, get beers with Tarzan Yamada. That's right. Anyway, guys, thanks a lot. Hope you enjoyed this video. Don't uh, forget, like, subscribe, buy a t-shirt, buy 15 t-shirts. Yeah. And if you are a VTech Academy uh, viewer, you might want to go over to Mighty Car Mods and check out their install. They did a really nice job with that car. And they, they got some, uh, they're about to have some mad plans. Mad plans. It's going to be freaking massive. We'll talk to you guys later.